Good morning, dear colleagues and friends. I called meeting to order. May I remind colleagues once more that the election of committee officers for 23rd annual session of the assembly will take place during this session. Any problem there? No. Okay. This session of the committee will close at uh, 11. And I propose that the draft agenda distributed for this morning meeting be adopted. Any objections? No? The draft agenda is adopted. Thank you. We will start with consideration of supplementary items. We will take supplementary items in the order in which they are set out on, on the agenda. We must allow time to conduct the elections for officers of the committee. And so we may not be able to consider all supplementary item remaining in any items we do not consider will be referred to the plenary session for further discussion. The first supplementary item on the agenda is the draft resolution on Belarus sponsored by Mr. Holm of Sweden. Mr. Holm, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, unfortunately, I'd say I put forward a resolution on this topic again. Uh, we do it every year, uh, and uh, I would be the first to be happy if we wouldn't have to pass a resolution like this. Uh, but unfortunately, the last years, and also uh, comparing last year with this year, we haven't seen any improvement whatsoever when it comes to the human rights conditions, when it comes to the democratic situation in Belarus. Uh, we know how it was. It escalated uh, in 2010 with uh, crackdowns on, uh, on uh, people manifest manifesting uh, towards the huge fraud when it came to the presidential election. We had and observed an election in October 2012, uh, which was after the last resolution was taken. We could see there were not free and fair elections. We have a parliament without uh, any opposition. We have a parliament consisting of 110 members, which we can't say are elected at all, more or less appointed. If they were in a so-called election, that was not free at all. Therefore, uh, in a number of uh, bullet points in the resolution, we are raising the concern uh, both for the lack of democracy, for the fact that there are political prisoners. There are people also who are not political prisoners that are given by name here. Uh, people uh, that also have attended our sessions like Irina Kalip, Vladimir Nikolaev, Vital Remanshevsky, Sergei Vosniak, Andrei Dmitriev, and Alex Feluta, and others that are not in prison but also are not allowed to leave their country. So they are in prison in Belarus, so to say. But we also have youth leaders like uh, Smitra Dashkevich who are still in prison since the election in 2010 and under severe, severe conditions with reports on tortures. So therefore, I urge the Assembly to um, approve this uh, resolution in order to continue to put the pressure on the dictator Alexander Lukashenko and his team. Thank you, Mr. Holm. And now the debate uh, on the draft agenda is open. Inscriptions? Uh, I see Belarus. You have the floor. Уважаемый госпожа председатель, уважаемые коллеги, я, конечно, с сожалением выслушал заявление автора резолюции, и, конечно же, было бы значительно лучше, если бы он говорил о том, какие есть у нас движения вперед и что действительно соответствует действительности, а не так, как он здесь преподнес. Более того, даже оскорбительно для меня, не зная, какую я роль играю в своем избирательном округе и как ко мне относятся избиратели. Уважаемые коллеги, в 
Парламентской ассамблее ОБСЕ уже третий год подряд вносится на рассмотрение фактически один и тот же текст резолюции под названием «Беларусь», в котором только меняются местами абзацы. Его авторы упорно жонглируют избитыми недостоверными аргументами и устаревшими фактами, настойчиво навязывая нам свои предвзятые оценки, не зная истинного положения дел в моей стране. Как уже здесь говорилось, подобные резолюции веют духом конфронтации и холодной войны. Тенденциозные заявления и беспочвенные обвинения не могут стать основой для равноправного диалога и сотрудничества. Наоборот, они порождают недоверие и тормозят налаживание взаимовыгодного взаимодействия. Сегодня у нас идет нормальный процесс взаимодействия с ОБСЕ. В марте Минск посетили эксперты БГИПЧ ОБСЕ для обсуждения итогового отчета по парламентским выборам в Беларуси 2012 года и содержавшихся в нем выводов и рекомендаций. Хотел бы также отметить недавний визит в Минск представителя ОБСЕ по свободе СМИ Дуни Миятович, в рамках которого состоялось множество встреч и содержательных переговоров, в том числе и в парламенте. Представитель ОБСЕ также приняла участие в семинаре тренинге по проблематике СМИ для белорусских журналистов. Беларусь активно борется с торговлей людьми, противодействует наркотрафику и нелегальной миграции в Европу. Совместно с ОБСЕ эффективно реализует у себя проект по повышению безопасности хранения легкого и стрелкового оружия, обеспечивает все условия для бесперебойного транзита энергоресурсов в Европу. Да и наше активное участие в работе всех комитетов – свидетельство неравнодушия моей страны к положению дел в регионе ОБСЕ. В последнее время наметились определенные позитивные подвижки в отношениях и активизировались наши контакты с ПАСЕ. Совместно с Советом Европы две недели назад мы провели в Минске круглый стол по проблематике смертной казни. Председатель комиссии по международным делам парламента, он же руководитель рабочей группы по проблематике смертной казни, по приглашению ПАСЕ на прошлой неделе выступил на заседании политического комитета в рамках сессии ПАСЕ. На днях наш парламент принял закон о ратификации Конвенции Совета Европы о борьбе с торговлей людьми. Сейчас мы продолжаем работу над совершенствованием избирательного кодекса Республики Беларусь, в том числе с учетом рекомендаций ОБСЕ. И на этом фоне сегодня предлагается принять резолюцию, которая игнорирует эту динамику и, по сути, нацелена на то, чтобы подорвать постепенно набирающий темп и содержание наш диалог с европейскими партнерами по широкому кругу вопросов, в том числе в сфере демократии и свободы СМИ. Авторы данной резолюции не видят, либо не хотят видеть объективные факты. Конституция и законы Республики Беларусь подготовлены с учетом наилучшего международного опыта, в том числе с учетом мнения Венецианской комиссии. И при этом нам настойчиво предлагается изменить ряд основополагающих законов и, более того, даже переписать Конституцию. Не видим смысла полемизировать по подобному документу. Разумеется, мы готовы к взаимоуважительному диалогу в случае наличия с вашей стороны, уважаемые коллеги, определенного минимума доброй воли, в основе которой – было бы истинное стремление честно и объективно видеть и оценивать процесс демократизации с учетом конкретной национальной специфики и исторически сложившихся непростых реалий. Пока же Беларусь сталкивается с явно предвзятым подходом. К нам предъявляются более высокие, чем другим странам, требования. Те самые двойные стандарты. Мы не отрицаем, что у нас могут быть и, наверное, есть определенные проблемы. Впрочем, как и в любой другой стране в регионе ОБСЕ. Недавно МИД Беларуси подготовил доклад, в котором содержится конкретная информация о серьезных Please, нарушениях. 
Госпожа председатель, я не, буду участвовать, я не буду участвовать в поправках, поэтому позвольте еще буквально 30 секунд. Благодарю вас за понимание. В котором содержится конкретная информация о серьезных нарушениях прав человека в целом ряде стран зрелой демократии. Призываю коллег ознакомиться с ней. Однако... Мы не считаем это поводом штамповать резолюции в парламентской ассамблее ОБСЕ по каждому такому случаю, по каждой стране. Мы неоднократно подчеркивали, что мы за продвижение вперед, за развитие диалога и сотрудничества, в том числе по вопросам формирования демократических институтов и защиты прав человека. Следует четко понимать, что принятие этой резолюции – в силу ее обозначенной необъективности не продвинет нас вперед на пути к диалогу или к совместному поиску решений накопившихся проблем в нашей повестке дня. Наоборот, эта резолюция носит ярко выраженный, контрпродуктивный и более того оскорбительный для нас характер. Прошу вас, коллеги, не поддерживать эту резолюцию, проголосовать против нее и тем самым проголосовать за сотрудничество Ради чего мы здесь и работаем. Благодарю за внимание. Я, госпожа председатель, приношу извинения. Я не буду участвовать при рассмотрении поправок, поэтому вы на мне еще даже сэкономите. Благодарю вас. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I apologize for the delay. Um, just let me point out that I rise in strong support of the resolution. Thank um, uh, the distinguished sponsor for bringing it to the Parliamentary Assembly, Mr. Holm. Uh, paragraph 8, Madam Chair, takes special note of the Belarus Democracy Act of 2011. I would note parenthetically that I am the prime sponsor of that law as well as two other laws, including the Belarus Democracy Act of 2004 and 2006. The Belarus Democracy Act of 2004 contained numerous human rights provisions. Among them, one, targeted economic sanctions against individuals and corporations who commit egregious human rights abuse violations, and second, visa denial, and the, the, the promulgation of a list of individuals uh, who commit human rights violations who are then rendered ineligible uh, and inadmissible to the United States. The sanctions, I believe, and I hope this assembly believes because this resolution embodies that very thought, are focused, they're calibrated, and are designed to ensure that only those with personal human rights complicity are sanctioned. This is not a broad-based effort to sanction Belarus, but a very targeted sanction on those who commit the abuse. Clearly, the crackdown on human rights activists and independent journalists that followed the December 2010 presidential elections left no doubt whatsoever that President Lukashenko continues to have contempt for human rights and democracy. And I would note parenthetically, perhaps in a, in a reciprocity sense, I can't get a visa to go to Belarus. I have been there once recently. I met with President Lukashenko, raised human rights issues along with other colleagues from the House and the U.S. Senate. Uh, but I have been barred from going to Minsk or to any other uh, spot in Belarus. Uh, we believe, I believe, I think all of us who care about human rights believe you focus the sanctions only on those who commit the abuse. And I thank you. Thank you. And now uh, I give the floor to Estonia. 
Thank you. Uh, just a short remark. I absolutely agree with my Swedish colleagues that unfortunately it's again time for that resolution. Uh, because from our side I can just tell that in Estonia seeks political uh, protection quite many Belarusian journalists. And I know that uh, the same subject in Poland. It means that uh, they are repressed in their own country. So I think that everyone who well, uses his head is for that resolution. Thank you. I give the floor to the Russia Federation now. Уважаемые, уважаемые коллеги, докладчик Христиан Хольм использовал, на мой взгляд, типичный набор идеологизированных штампов, прежде всего рассуждений о наличии в республике политзаключенных. На мой взгляд, отмечаю, что если бы докладчик был озабочен ситуацией с правами человека в Беларуси, то необходимо идти на диалог, именно диалог. Мы парламентская ассамблея ОБСЕ а не говорить языком санкций. Это не наш язык, не язык парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ, который похож на небезызвестный американский закон о белорусской демократии и правах человека и ряд решений Евросоюза. Мы все-таки еще раз подчеркиваю, что отличаемся и американского законодательства, которое принимается, и ряда решений Евросоюза. Мы парламентская ассамблея. Тем более, что уже отмечалось, Сам Минск, Минск от разговора не уклоняется. И, к примеру, буквально вот на днях там побывал представитель нашего парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ по свободе средств массовой информации Метлович, который получил ответы на все вопросы. Причем диалог был достаточно длительный, конструктивный, и, на мой взгляд, он был удовлетворен этим диалогом. Я считаю, что мы, мы как парламентская ассамблея, должны идти именно по этому пути – а не по пути конфронтации, нагнетания обстановки без аргументов. Без аргументов – это, опять подчеркиваю, не наш стиль, не стиль ОБСЕ. Поэтому считаю, что данная резолюция, принятие ее, только усугубит обстановку и отдалит процесс сближения позиции ОБСЕ и Белоруссии. Спасибо. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak about this draft resolution? Anyone more? I give the floor to Mr. Holm. Thank you again, once again, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to comment a little bit of uh, what uh, my colleague Mr. Gominski said and uh, also a little bit to the uh, intervention from uh, my Russian colleague. Uh, of course, dialogue is always good. We have been trying with dialogue with Belarus for years. Uh, in 2008, the Euro European Union had a new strategy for dialogue with the authorities in Belarus. Uh, there were uh, possible, uh, there, the sanctions was not lifted and the visa ban, but there was uh, possibilities still for them to come into the European Union. There were increased dialogues, there were increased contacts and then we had the presidential election in 2010 where the crackdown was harsher than in any uh, earlier uh, election. And I regret, as I said, the fact that we don't have a functioning dialogue. I regret the fact that apparently both the presidential administration and the members of parliament from uh, Belarus don't really want to discuss issues concerning freedom of, me freedom of press, uh, political prisoners, democratic development and so on, but focus on other issues. But I think human rights issues, freedom of press and democracy is essential issues for uh, the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. And with all that which is listed in the resolution, which is of course not taken uh, from anywhere, it's taken by facts, it's taken by reports and uh, the specific situation on the ground in Belarus. And yes, I've been there myself, I've seen it. Uh, I'm not able to go there as often as I want because I'm on the blacklist of uh, talking about sanctions on the, from uh, the authorities of Belarus, so I can't really go there every time I want. But 
still, we need to continue, and I'm the first one who would like to sit down with anyone from Belarus to discuss democratic development, human rights, and immediate release of political prisoners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the debate about the draft agenda. Three amendments have been allowed, uh, tabled to the draft agenda of resolution. I shall allow the proposers of amendments to speak for a maximum of one minute and then allow the same time to an opponent to the amendment and ask the sponsor of the draft resolution for his opinion before putting the amendment, the amendment to the vote. I call now Mr. Bartus of Ms. Bartus of Poland to propose amendment one. Thank you. Madam Chair, dear colleagues, the aim of amendment is to extend and update the paragraph. When we mention repressive actions against the Vyasna Center, I would be relevant to highlight the case of its leader, Alex Bialatsky, who is still in prison serving the sentence in penal colony. He is still harassed and to use the full name of organization as well. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? No, I give the, I give the floor to Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> well, uh, I uh, apparently haven't signed this uh, amendment, but uh, I don't have any problems with uh, agreeing with it. So I think it, I, my recommend, recommendation would be to adopt it. I put the amendment to the vote. Votes in favor, please raise your cards. Votes against. Abstentions. The amendment is adopted. Amendment two, I call again Ms. Bartus of Poland to propose this amendment. Thank you. The aim of amendment is to extend the paragraph uh, by changing words politically prisoners into members of the opposition who after a politically motivated trial. I think uh, it would be relevant to highlight wherever possible in the resolution what really happened to those persons. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Berthus. Uh, does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? No. Mr. Holm, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is actually a correct clarification that uh, which words you use. And uh, well, they are on um, suspended sentences uh, and uh, not allowed to leave the country, but uh, they are officially not political prisoners. So it's a correct correction by my Pol Polish colleagues. So uh, I would. Uh, I would agree with this amendment as well. Very well, thank you. Um, I put the amendment to the vote. Votes in favor, please raise your cards. Votes against. Abstentions. The amendment is adopted. Amendment three. And I call Ms. Varthus of Poland to propose this amendment. Uh, the aim of amendment is to extend this part of the resolution. It is important to express uh, our full conviction of the necessity of close cooperation of the Belarusian authorities with the OSCE representative of on freedom of the media. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against? No. Mr. Holm, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair. Uh, well, uh, even a good resolution can be improved. And uh, I've signed this amendment, and I think it's a very good amendment. And uh, after having listened to both uh, Mr. Gominski and to the colleagues from Russia, I suppose this would be something welcome, which I hope that 
also uh, the Belarusian delegation votes in favor of, after having spoken about the visit on uh, the OSCE, OSCE media representative in Belarus. And uh, that it hopefully then would be good to have a continuous cooperation there. So yes, I hope that uh, we will allow uh, the, media, the, the representative non-freedom of the media to develop uh, the media uh, policies in Belarus. So uh, I would recommend the Parliamentary Assembly to vote in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Holm. I put now the amendment three to the vote. Votes in favor, please raise your cards. Votes against. Abstentions. The amendment is adopted. And I propose that we now formally move to the vote on the draft agenda. Will those in favor of adopting the draft agenda please rise the voting cards? Okay, 42. Votes against, please raise your card. Eight. Abstentions? Okay, the draft agenda is adopted. The second supplementary item is the draft resolution on citizen issues sponsored by Mr. Nikolai Kovalev of Russian Federation. Mr. Kovalev, you have the floor to present the resolution. Уважаемые коллеги, представит Рашкин Валерий Федорович вместо Николая Ковалева. Уважаемые коллеги, мы, изучая вопрос безгражданства на пространстве территории ОБСЕ, констатируем, что сохраняется практически во всех странах, без исключения, ситуация, связанная с безгражданством на пространстве ОБСЕ. Мы признаем, что каждый имеет право на гражданство и что никто не может быть произвольно лишен своего гражданства, исходим этого положения и придаем особое внимание обеспечению основных прав и свобод человека, уважение которых является существенным фактором мира, справедливости и благополучия. Мы также принимаем во внимание, что предотвращение безгражданства является одним из основных вопросов международного сообщества в сфере гражданства, чем и занимается Парламентская ассамблея ОБСЕ, а также положение всеобщей декларации прав человека и международного пакта о гражданских и политических прав. Мы, конечно, при разработке данного проекта резолюции учитывали и положение Конвенции Организации Объединенных Наций о статусе лиц без гражданства, Конвенции ООН о сокращении без гражданства, Европейскую Конвенцию о гражданстве. Европейскую конвенцию о недопущении безгражданства в связи с правоприемством государств. Мы основываемся обязательно в своей резолюции на обязательствах ОБСЕ, связанных с обеспечением права на гражданство и закрепленных в документах саммитов и СМИТ ОБСЕ. Мы обращаем внимание, что при разработке данной резолюции на то, что суще, существующие меры по сокращению числа лиц, не имеющих гражданства, в том числе путем предоставления им гражданства, автоматически по рождению порядка регистрации или натурализации недостаточны для окончательного решения данной проблемы. И констатируем, что необходимо государствам участников ОБСЕ объединить усилия для выработки наиболее эффективных механизмов 
по обеспечению права человека на гражданство. Исходя из этого, мы проработали в проекте резолюции ряд призывов и рекомендаций парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ. Они изложены у нас в проекте резолюции, касающиеся нескольких фактов. Особенно это обращая внимание на то, чтобы и призываем участников ОБСЕ подтвердить, что расовые, этнические, религиозные или политические мотивы не должны служить основанием для лишения лица или группы лиц их гражданства. Также участники ОБСЕ призываем принять эффективные меры для обеспечения права на гражданство лицам, постоянно проживающих на их территориях. Призываем также участников государства ОБСЕ совершенствовать свою правовую базу в целях недопущения без гражданства. Принимать все возможные меры для сокращения числа лиц, не имеющих гражданства, в том числе путем предотвращения самого производства без гражданства. И также обеспечить эффективную правовую поддержку и защиту постоянно проживающих в стране лиц, не имеющих гражданства, в вопросах обеспечения гражданских, политических и экономических прав. Поэтому предлагаем рассмотреть проект резолюции вопроса гражданства обсудить и принять. Спасибо. Thank you. I must present my excuses because it's not Mr. Kovagev but, but Mr. Raskin. And now I give the floor to Mr. Shestinia from Czech Republic. Спасибо за слово, госпожа председатель, уважаемые дамы и господа. Текст этой резолюции, он очень общий. Там не называется ни одна страна, ни один регион. Но я думаю, что мы все, включая авторов этой резолюции, явно, что этот проект касается именно стран, где проживает в меньшинстве русскоязычное население. Именно страны бывшего Советского Союза, именно страны Прибалтики, как Литва, Латвия, Эстония. Я бы хотел сказать, что эти русскоязычные меньшинства, они являются жертвами нарушений, большого нарушения человеческих прав. Но в том смысле, что они являются жертвами этого сталинского коммунистического времени, где злоупотреблялись политически, политическим целом владельцев Советского Союза. Я не могу поддержать эту резолюцию. Буду голосовать, конечно, против, потому что я думаю, что если я бы поддержал, я бы поддержал эту традиционную схему злоупотребления российских меньшин в странах, окружающих сегодняшнюю Россию. Это искусственное, целесообразное и иногда насильственное злоупотребление российско-российского населения продолжается. Поэтому я буду голосовать против. Спасибо. I have the inscription of Latvia. Latvia, yes, you have the floor. Dear Madam Chair, dear colleagues, it is important to take into account the reality that non-citizens are not the same as stateless persons. Exactly the opposite is true. Non-citizens belong to a country because they have been given many economical and social political rights. On the international arena, the terms stateless persons and non-citizens must be used accurately, and the two terms cannot be interchanged. While the Russian Federation confuses these two categories and modifies the facts in the supplementary item, they have proposed we as OSCE parliamentarians should not support it. The supplementary item 
is biased, superficial, and uh, it is controversial in itself. Uh, it is with narrow political aims. The aim of this supplementary item is not to improve the situation of stateless persons, but rather to change the citizenship laws and the procedures for acquiring citizenship in other countries. By proposing this, the Russian Federation is also treating unequally the migrants that have arrived in the last 20 years. But such an equal treatment is not acceptable. Therefore, I urge you to vote against this supplementary item. Thank you for attention. Thank you. I give the floor to Estonia. Thank you. Well, to talk about this resolution and remember the subject of citizenship, first of all, well, like my colleagues before did here, I have to mention that in that resolution we have both technical and linguistical misunderstandings and mistakes. Okay, I can agree with our Russian friends that citizenship is everyone's human right, okay? If one wants to have it, if one wants it through normal procedures, like in every normal country, he must have it. But is Russia considering itself normal? I think they guess. In Russia, you may get your Russian passport and citizenship only if you know Russian language. This is bright truth, absolutely blue sky. But at the same time, this resolution is really funny, sadly, because here we talk about people with no state, as our colleagues mentioned. I really think that our Russian friends uh, are not talking about some tribes living in some kind of unmapped jungle. Everyone lives in some state. So is this resolution demagogical? Exactly, yes. Our Russian friends want to use the word stateless instead of a person who has not that or that country passport, but still who demands to talk and build his life, for example, in Russian language. And just, oh sorry, in the countries he's a language guest. And I remind you that the word stateless nation has absolutely exact meaning. If Russia really wants to talk about it, then remember that we have unrepresented nations and people's organization, UNPO, what was established in Hague in 1991. It means organization of nations who doesn't, nations who doesn't have a state, for example, Tibetans or Uyghurs and so on. But Russians have their state. They can be Russian, Russians and have Russian cities worldwide. And if Russia is very worried about stateless people, then let me remind that in Russian territory lives 15 Fenno-Yuglian small please, nations please. without any state and rights to use their language, culture, and so on. Now they are simply tying out because Russia has closed almost every opportunity for their free own language education, free journalism, and etc. and etc. So therefore, I think this please, resolution is finish. schizophrenic. Uh, the word stateless is working against Russian agenda, and I think it is demagogic, and Estonia is strictly and strongly against that resolution. Thank you. Give the floor to Belarus, and after Latvia. Уважаемые коллеги, как у нас говорят, лучшая защита – это наступление, и выступление коллег из Прибалтики – дружественных нам государств, соседей, свидетельство того, что действительно вопрос, который подняла сегодня Россия, имеет право на жизнь. И надо не наступать или защищаться, а надо просто сесть и проработать эти вопросы, чтобы они не возникали на, в регионе ОБСЕ и так далее. И меня очень удивило выступление моего чешского коллеги. С уважением отношусь к этой стране, я много там проработал, но это как раз образец того, о чем я говорил в своем предыдущем выступлении. Это, говоря о сталинизме, это как раз и есть дух холодной войны, и оно нас вперед не продвинет. Я предлагаю поддержать резолюцию Российской Федерации. Спасибо. Latvia, you have to go. Um, I'd like to follow up <coughs> on both the um, Czech uh, colleagues 
notes and also on the Estonian colleagues' notes. Um, first of all, I just want to make quite sure that everybody understands that in Latvia, the Russian-speaking part of the population is there only because of Soviet occupation. They either arrived there during the Soviet occupation or were born of parents who arrived during the Soviet occupation. I think the Estonian colleague made a very good point. The Russians have their state. They have nothing to complain about. And if anybody has anything to learn or to use this resolution, it's the Russians themselves who should be listening to their own resolution. And they could take example from Latvia. Latvia has a very liberal, very approachable way to getting naturalized. Children born of non-citizens, stateless persons, and other foreign persons can automatically get Latvian citizenship. You must finish, please. I will finish very shortly. Their parents have the right to decide in the end whether they want their children to become Latvian citizens. And to hear from our colleagues from Belarus that this is an attack by Baltic state representatives, in my view, is complete nonsense and a complete misunderstanding of historical fact. Thank you very much for the time you've given me. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak about this draft resolution? No. Um, Mr. Kovalev. Kovalev. Уважаемый председатель, уважаемые коллеги, спасибо большое. Прошу прощения за опоздание. Я был на первом комитете, где важные резолюции принимались, и там выступал. Поэтому извините, не успел к началу. Я бы хотел прежде всего по результатам обсуждения, которые мы с вами услышали, сделать несколько, высказать некоторые соображения, отталкиваясь от которых, мне кажется, нам будет легче искать ту самую истину, в которой мы заинтересованы. Первое. Конечно, и Россия в том числе должна эти э, правила соблюдать, эти законы, и именно на это резолюция направлена. Да, это касается и Российской Федерации в том числе. Если коллеги говорили о недостатках лингвистического характера, либо каких-то других недостатках документа, мы готовы каждое ваше замечание учесть, Готовы принять их в виде поправок? Пожалуйста, коллеги, улучшайте документ. Мы готовы к сотрудничеству. Но документ направлен на главное. Мы все в наших странах должны сделать все возможное, чтобы не граждан у нас практически не было. Потому что это основная форма защиты прав человека, людей, которые проживают у нас на территории наших государств. Вот на что направлена эта резолюция. Мне кажется, это абсолютно в духе сотрудничества, абсолютно в духе ОБСЕ. Коллега сказал, что в России невозможно получить гражданство, не зная языка. Слушайте, ну нельзя же до такой степени искажать действительность. Я понимаю пафос. Ну, пример, Депардье, всем вам известный французский актер, не знает он русского языка, стал гражданином. И таких примеров тысячи. Поэтому надо быть все-таки очень и очень объективными и не путать понятия, которое, мне кажется, произошло смешение понятий без государства и без гражданства. Поэтому еще раз подчеркну, конечно, резолюция касается абсолютно всех государств. И я призываю всех поддержать эту резолюцию. Мне кажется, она абсолютно выдержана в духе сотрудничества. Это самое главное. Thank you, Mr. Kovalev. That concludes the debate um, on draft agenda. Two amendments have been tabled to the draft agenda resolution, and I call Mr. Liepik, Liepins of Latvia to propose Amendment 1. Uh, amendment 1 is written in the spirit of making sure that naturalization is not 
just a bureaucratic mechanism for getting citizenship. It's much more than that. It's a question of people entering into a cultural, into a society, ad adopting the culture, adopting the practices of the country, as I have done when I've lived in Canada. And they have to be loyal to the country whose citizenship they get. And this is the point I want to stress. In Latvia, we have a problem that there are naturalized Russian-speaking citizens who very clearly are not loyal to Latvia. So I urge you to adopt this amendment. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? It's a good opinion. Does anyone wish to speak against? No? I give the floor to Mr. Kovaryev to express his opinion as sponsor of this um, draft resolution. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. Знаете, абсолютно понятно, чем руководствовался, руководствовались авторы поправки, внося ее. И можно было бы согласиться. Однако меня смущает редакция. Ну, например, обратите внимание, натурализация является не самоцелью. Ну, в общем, конечно, это не самоцель. Не в этом смысл. Смысл натурализации в, за... в конечном счете в защите прав человека. И говоря только о натурализации в этой поправке, мы забываем о том, что надо тогда добавлять и филиацию, то есть предоставление гражданства по факту рождения, но еще многие-многие аспекты. Поэтому я все-таки предлагаю эту поправку отклонить, ввиду того, что она не добавляет ничего нового в резолюцию. I put amendment one to the vote. Votes in favor, please raise your cards. Okay, votes against. Abstentions? The amendment is adopted. And I call now, now Ms. Pacosta of Estonia to propose amendment two. Ms. Pacosta is in other committee, but uh, I will pretend her. So uh, this amendment, uh, well, if we see that point number 14, uh, well, let me read it. Uh, legal support and protection of stateless persons permanently residing in their territories. What does it mean, stateless persons residing in their territories? And now we're talking about their political rights. Excuse me, I have one question. Uh, can in Russia people without no Russian citizen, uh, citizenship vote? Exactly not. This is ridiculous. So, we can uh, replace uh, the word political with social. It's much more fair, because uh, really, if one person doesn't have citizenship, he has his social rights, but for example, not right to vote without this country's passport. So, all in all, as Estonia is all in all against of that resolution, let us point out that uh, this amendment is 
makes some kind of this silly resolution more logical. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? No. Mr. Kovalev, you have the floor to give your opinion. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. Я бы хотел, чтобы вы все-таки делали замечание за некорректную оценку содержания резолюции. Эта резолюция затрагивает основные права людей, проживающих в мире. Нельзя так легко разбрасываться терминами глупое, иначе мы перейдем к оценке личностей. Так нельзя работать, это неправильно. Что касается поправки. Вы знаете, я соглашусь с автором, что в этом есть определенный резон. Единственное, что нельзя ставить знак равенства между политическими правами и социальными правами. Поэтому я бы предложил для комитета компромиссный вариант. Через запятую добавить слово «социальные права». Таким образом будет учтена и поправка, и будет, на мой взгляд, улучшен текст резолюции. Спасибо. I put now the amendment two to the vote. Votes in favor, please raise your cards. Point of order. Yes, you may. You have. Господин председатель, я озвучил предложение совместить все-таки эти поправки и добавить. Вот это предложение, мне кажется, должно быть рассмотрено и принято какое-то решение. I don't have translation here. I don't. Вы знаете, странно, no, I'm, I, почему I, все время I'm на русском this, языке? Can you repeat, uh, Вы знаете, yes, почему-то... Uh, We have a problem. The, the rule don't admit oral amendments. We must put in to the vote. Okay, now I have the, a better translation and, uh, and I can heard the translation. The problem is you want to join to the text the word social behind comma, okay? Very well. If anyone have objections? Absolutely objection because this is Estonian's amendment and I think it's not correct to do these things orally 
because it's not procedural, absolutely. All yes. will, yes, thank you. It's not procedural, but it's a, a very uh, simple uh, change. If you accept, you don't accept, you are sponsored. Against. And you are the sponsor. Uh, and a student is against it. Thank you. Russia, by procedure. Прошу прощения, России по процедуре. Yes, you have the floor. Уважаемые коллеги, но мы уже неоднократно и в других комитетах голосуем по устную поправку к поправке. Эта процедура принята у нас в ОБСЕ. Я бы просил, вот, коллега Ковалев предложил достаточно разумное и договорное предложение по этой поправке. Он действительно удовлетворяет и автора поправки и автора резолюции. Поэтому достаточно разумно, я считаю. Просто надо поставить на голосование и проголосовать. Спасибо. On the point of order, please. Uh, who is asking for a point of order? Valdis Leopinj from Latvia. Okay. We have had precedents in this same committee. Yes, yes, yes. If yes, there's an I'm, oral amendment, if yes, there is one objection, yes, it does not go further. Yes, and I'm going to speak about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Um, Raskin from uh, La Estonia. Uh, Mr. Wright from Estonia present the amendment. Mr. Kovalyek present an oral amendment. Yesterday, we don't accept oral amendments by the rule. I appeal to Mr. Wright to accept this amendment because it's a very simple amendment. He refused to accept this amendment. Now we are going to vote the amendment as he is presented by Mr. Wright the first, the first version of the amendment. We are going to vote. I put this amendment like it's in the text to the vote, okay? Everybody understand? Okay. Let's go to, to vote. Vote in favor. Please raise your cards. Votes against, please raise your cards. Abstentions now. Okay. The amendment is adopted. 
And that concludes the discussion about amendments. Thank you. I propose that we now formally move to a vote on the draft resolution as amended. Will those in favor of adapting the draft resolution please write their voting cards? Votes against. Abstentions, please. The amendment is defeated. It's clear. Okay. We will now move before considering the remaining supplementary item. Oh, no. Third supplementary item on the agenda is the draft resolution on promoting freedom of religion on or belief in the OSC region, sponsored by Mr. Allison of Canada. Thank Mr. Allison. You. Thank okay. you, Madam Chair, and uh, to my fellow parliamentarians, I just want to thank, start off by thanking all of you for your support of my supplementary item, and in particular, the 50 or so parliamentarians who offered their signatures as uh, co-sponsors. Such a volume of support heartens me to, that so many of you share my regard for this topic and my perspective that diversity enriches our outlook and our experiences. My intention for sponsoring a supplementary item on promoting freedom of religion or belief in the OSC region was not to single out one country or to detail the numerous instances where individuals and entire groups are discriminated against or face violations or are persecuted for their religion or belief, I believe these are already well documented by others. Instead, I was motivated to highlight the remedies. To Please stop a little moment. We need conditions because uh, it's everybody circulating in the room. Please. We are almostly finishing the, the agenda try to give us better conditions. Okay, you can thank, move. Thank you, Madam Chair. Instead, I was motivated to highlight the remedies to emphasize that the work is not yet done in order that mutual respect and tolerance in the diversity of the OSC region to be strengthened. I feel strongly that calling on our governments and ourselves as parliamentarians to meet these obligations to ensure strong legislative frameworks and undertake initiatives related to interfaith dialogues are vital to facilitating and strengthening mutual understanding, tolerance, and respect. Each of our countries promotes and protects freedom of religion or belief in its own way. But how this is done must reflect the commitments and the obligations we have undertaken at the OSCE and other international fora, as well as in international covenants and declarations. As we know too well, some better than others, regrettably, Tensions and conflicts arise from intolerance 
xenophobia, extremism, distrust, and hate, promoting freedom of religion or belief, acknowledging and protecting our diversity serves to strengthen the democratic foundations on which are built peace, stability, and prosperity. These are in the central hands, or the central tenets of the OSCE, which have committed to uphold. I strongly believe that this supplementary item speaks to all of us, and I ask you for your continued support. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. And now the discussion, this debate is open. Inscriptions to this debate. Malta, you have the floor. And after Belgium. And thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, uh, let me convey my views of my fundamental position on what constitutes a democracy. It is only, not only the right to vote, just as it is not only uh, the right of the majority. The freedom of expression, the freedom of religion, separation of powers, and free inde independent press are some of the basic elements that characterize a democracy. These principles cannot be fulfilled without mutual respect between people. A mutual respect for each other's rights and feelings is a main key in a democratic and peaceful society. Freedom and responsibility goes hand in hand and cannot be separated. We can disagree, we can discuss, but we feel like the French philosopher Voltaire who once, once said, I disagree with you, what, with what you said, but I will die for your right to say it. It is of vital importance to understand that freedom of religion and freedom of ideas are meaningless without the freedom of expression. Try to imagine what will be left of the freedom of re religion if you are not entitled to express your faith. In other words, freedom of expression is the precondition for the freedom of religion. Every religion seeks to promote peace, understanding and justice. Peace and justice are the basis for good international relations. Only these can promote international security and stability. Interreligious dialogue, interreligious social contacts, especially in voluntary work, help promotion of understanding and tolerance between people of different races and different religions. Moreover, religious leaders should curb fanatism based on religious grounds. I do hope that we here present for this assembly understand that only through mutual respect and understanding we can build a better world. Bearing this in mind, I urge you to vote in favor of this supplementary item. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Belgium. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Rapidement, je, je trouve cette proposition intéressante parce qu'effectivement, la liberté de conviction, la liberté de pensée, la liberté de conscience est un point important dans nos démocraties. Je voulais tout simplement relever le fait que dans, cette, dans ce point additionnel, on ne met pas suffisamment l'accent sur le fait que ce qui garantit le mieux cette liberté, c'est bien la séparation entre les cultes et l'État. Et je ne vois pas exactement cela dans cette proposition. Et donc j'aurais aimé que l'interprétation, la lecture de cette proposition fasse apparaître que cette garantie puisse être euh, exprimée par cette séparation entre le culte et l'État. Merci. Thank you. And now Mr. Coleman from Canada. I'd like to begin by congratulating my colleague for this supplementary item and urging members of the Assembly to support it. As already mentioned, each of our countries promotes and protects freedom of religion or belief in its own way. In Canada, for instance, 
Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms is, is hailed as an important tool for protecting freedom of religion or belief, particularly against legislation and government action that might otherwise violate it. Moreover, this freedom features prominently in Canada's multiculturalism policy, which celebrates the cultural and relig religious diversity of our population. Freedom of religion or belief is especially vital for vulnerable minority groups who face various forms of discrimination and even violence, whether they reside in our own countries or elsewhere. Accordingly, just a few months ago, Canada established the Office of Religious Freedom, which will be dedicated to promoting freedom of religion or belief as a key Canadian foreign policy priority. With an annual budget of five million Canadian dollars, the office is mandated to focus on defending religious minorities, monitoring religious freedom, and speaking out against egregious violations of freedom of religion. We as parliamentarians must commit ourselves to ensuring that our governments do even more to uphold this fundamental freedom as a key value of our societies. The challenge in this respect is, as always, to balance the freedom of religion with the entire body of human rights commitments and with reasonable limits that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. In this context, Canada itself continues to struggle with issues related to head coverings and other religious symbols in public spaces in the face of its changing social and political culture. Other examples touch on religious groups whose belief systems prohibit photographs from being taken, raising complications for government-issued photo-based identification cards, such as the case of the Hutterites and driver's licenses. Regrettably, this list of issues also includes anti-Semitism and other hate crimes targeting religious groups. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that these are complex and even contentious matters, but by strengthening the capacity of our legal structures and holding public dialogues, we can take important steps towards reinforcing freedom of religion in the context of other human rights and thereby towards greater mutual respect and tolerance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Smith for USA. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. First, let me thank um, the distinguished author of this resolution, Mr. Allison, uh, for his not only timely, but his extraordinarily important resolution. There is a need to address a disturbing trend whereby governments in the OSCE region persecute people for their religious beliefs and fail to protect members of religious minorities from discrimination and violence. Laws in a number of participating states discriminate against so-called non-traditional religious communities and criminalize proselytizing, resulting in members of religious communities being targeted for harassment and legal sanctions by government authorities. Some participating states misuse so-called extremism laws to target peaceful expression of religious beliefs, so to unjustly imprison and harass members of religious and other communities. A number of OSCE participating states have registration requirements that discriminate against minority religious groups that can result in criminal sanctions for engaging in so-called unregistered religious activities. Others have banned or attempted to ban head coverings and other religious attire in public places. Such laws and actions, Madam Chair, it should be noted, often serve as precursors of other more extreme discriminatory practices and even violence. These practices run counter to OSCE commitments on freedom of religion, as specified in the Vienna document from 1989, which requires participating states to, quote, respect the right of religious communities to establish and maintain freely accessible places of worship or assembly and organize themselves according to their own hierarchical and institutional structure. Again, I want to thank our good and distinguished colleague for, from Canada for sponsoring and authoring this important resolution. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Aderholt of USA. Uh, th thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chairman. Uh, I, I just wanted to commend the uh, gentleman from Canada as well for his resolution. Uh, the freedom of religion, thought, conscious, or belief is a, is a fundamental right. And uh, I think by the OSC and by this committee going on record, uh, concerning this issue is very important, and I would encourage all of my uh, colleagues here to support the resolution.
I call now Mr. Allison to respond to the debate. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just uh, in the essence of time, I know that uh, time is moving on here in the session. There's another resolution. Uh, I want to thank all my honourable colleagues for their comments and uh, appreciate their support for the bill. Okay, thank you. And that concludes the debate of the draft resolution. Two amendments have been tabled to draft resolution. Amendment one, I call Mr. Fittis of Cyprus to propose this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair Goma. Uh, we congratulate uh, Mr. Allison about uh, his excellent resolution. My first amendment is the following, the rationale, I mean. By the proposed amendment, we wish to stress the significance of the respecting and protecting religious sites, artifacts, and symbols, including in the event of art conflicts, this worth being an integral part of the world's cultural heritage. In this respect, it is also important that the need to maintain and safeguard religious sites and artifacts in post-conflict situation be stressed as they are remediated and systematic destruction in areas under foreign occupation is often tantamount to ethnic cleansing. This is my first. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? No one. I put the amendment to the vote. Oh, uh, you have the... Yes, anyone? You have bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm certainly okay with the amendment. Okay. I put the amendment to the vote. Votes in favor. Please raise your cards. Votes against, please raise your cards. Abstentions, the amendment is adopted. Amendment two, I call again Mr. Fittis of Cyprus. Thank you. By this amendment, we wish to stress that the freedom of worship including unimpeded access to religious sites, as well as uh, unobstructed training of the clergy, are essential elements in efforts to ensure and further promote freedom of religion. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? No. Please switch your microphone. microphone. No? Mr. Allison, you have the floor. Uh, thank you again, uh, Madam Chair, and to my, uh, my colleague, uh, the Honorable Member Mr. from Cyprus, I want to thank him for his uh, amendment. I think it helps strengthen the, uh, the uh, item, so I'll, I'll definitely send it. Thanks. Very well. I put now this amendment to the vote. Votes in favor. Please raise your cards. Votes against. Abstentions. The amendment is adopted. I propose that we now formally move to the vote, to a vote on the draft resolution. Will those in favor of the adopting draft resolution please rise the cards? Those against? Against? Abstentions? The, 
draft resolution is adopted. We are trying to finish all the agenda. We have 10 minutes to conclude <laughs> before going to the elections. The final supplementary item is the draft resolution on strengthening the role of education on combating, in combating racism, xenophobia, and other forms of intolerance in, uh, and discrimination, sponsored by Mr. Kul Kuloglu uh, of Turkey. Teşekkürler Sayın Başkan. Değerli arkadaşlar, Türkiye olarak hoşgörüsüzlük ve yabancı düşmanlığıyla mücadele konusunda konusuna özel önem veriyoruz. Anayasamız vatandaşların din, ırk, renk, etnik köken, dil ve benzeri özellikleri bakılmaksızın kanunlar önünde işte olduğunu söylemektedir. Ayrıca ülkemizde ayrımcılık yapmak kanunen yasaktır ve suç teşkil etmektedir. Anayasa ve kanunlardaki bu düzenlemeler çerçevesinde devletimiz, Ayrıştırıcı değil, birleştirici, dışlayıcı değil, kucaklayıcı tavır takınmaktadır. İnsan hakları konusunda politikamız herkes için ayrım gözetmeksizin insan hakları şeklindedir. Ayrımcılık, hoşgörüsüzlük ve yabancı düşmanlığının toplumlarımıza yönelik tehdit olduğuna her platformda dikkat çekiyoruz. Aynı hassasiyetin tüm Agit coğrafyası içerisinde gösterilmesine ve Agit bünyesindeki platformlarda bu konuya daha fazla ağırlık verilmesi gerektiğine inanıyoruz. Ayrımcılık ve hoşgörüsüzlüğün engellenmesine yönelik uzun vadeli çözümler için eğitime özel önem verilmesi gerektiğini düşünüyoruz. Özellikle gençler ve çocuklar arasında ayrımcılığın ve hoşgörüsüzlüğün ortaya çıkmasını engellemede eğitimin rolünün büyük olduğuna inanıyoruz. Bu nedenle AGİTPA'da bu konuda kabul edilecek karar tasarısının önemli bir rehber olacağını değerlendiriyoruz. Teşekkür ederim. Sağ olun. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now debate on draft uh, resolution is open. I have description of Ms. Demilly from France. Mr. Mr. Demilly Je suis from là. France. Madame la Présidente, mes chers collègues, permettez-moi tout d'abord de, de saluer l'engagement de nos collègues de la délégation turque qui ont fait du thème de la lutte contre le racisme, la xénophobie et l'intolérance un fil rouge de cette session plénière 2013, en organisant un, un grand événement dimanche et en présentant aujourd'hui à notre approbation un point supplémentaire dans notre commission. Lorsque nous pensons Helsinki plus 40, c'est souvent la dimension politico-militaire qui vient à l'esprit, compte tenu des impasses identifiées. Alors quel rapport avec l'éducation me direz-vous Je n'ai malheureusement pas pu être présent parmi vous dimanche, car chaque année à cette époque, dans ma circonscription, nous commémorons le souvenir du déclenchement d'une des batailles les plus meurtrières de l'histoire humaine, la bataille de la Somme pendant la Première Guerre mondiale. Je choisis de faire cette terrible référence historique parce que éduquer notre jeunesse à la tolérance, au respect et à la compréhension réciproque, au respect universel des droits de l'homme, C'est aussi l'espérance de faire disparaître de notre espace l'idée de la violence comme mode de résolution des conflits, l'idée de l'annihilation de l'autre au nom de sa différence et de la primauté de soi. J'ai d'ailleurs été tout à l'heure particulièrement sensible à la référence de notre collègue de Malte qui citait Voltaire. Voilà à mon sens le but ultime du renforcement du rôle de l'éducation dans la lutte contre le racisme, la xénophobie et les autres formes d'intolérance et de discrimination auxquelles appelle notre excellent collègue. L'OSCE l'a bien compris, qui en fait l'une de ses actions essentielles dans les régions encore traversées de tensions. Parce que les orateurs qui tout à l'heure ont évoqué différents points ont très bien développé ces aspects liés aux discriminations raciales, ethniques, religieuses et linguistiques, je souhaite aborder une autre discrimination, celle liée au handicap. Ce mot n'a pas été prononcé dans tous les débats que nous avons eus depuis quelques jours. Pourtant, si les conflits s'arrêtent un jour, il faut des décennies pour que leurs conséquences s'estompent dans les esprits, j'en ai parlé, mais aussi dans les chairs. Et là encore, l'éducation est un levier crucial pour faire tomber les préjugés, 
accepter dans la vie quotidienne cette différence et favoriser la participation sociale et économique de ceux de nos concitoyens qui sont handicapés. Quelle que soit, à vrai dire, l'origine de ce handicap, car bien évidemment, ce que je viens de développer s'applique non seulement dans les cycles post-conflit, mais aussi, bien sûr, à la cohésion sociale des pays de notre espace qui ont la chance d'être en paix. Thank you. If anyone wish to speak, uh, Norway, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Norway and my, I myself are going to support this item. Having said that, it is very interesting that uh, when I tabled uh, an item where we focused on the rights of, uh, of the of the Kurds, or rather violation of the rights of Kurds. Before we came to this, uh, this session, many from, uh, from the Kurdish delegation and the entire machinery of the Turks, Turk government tried all uh, their level best to, to take that, uh, that item off the table, and they succeeded in that. They were not able even to discuss what is happening in, uh, in Turkey, but ha we, what has been happening to Kurds in Turkey for the last 30 years. Many thousand people are sitting behind the bars. People have been uh, taken uh, away their civil rights, their political rights. Uh, people have been sentenced. Uh, people have been taken uh, away their cultural rights, their political rights, right to speak their language. So I, uh, I hope that uh, my Turk colleagues they also take up the rights of their own uh, minorities, both within their own country, but also on the international arena, that they show the, the, uh, some sort of uh, dare, the dare to talk about uh, the elephant in the room. It is not possible anymore to, to simply hop over uh, the, the rights of the Kurds and speak in, in general terms about xenophobia, racism, and all these things. This becomes sometimes very annoying to people who actually see what's happening to a particular minority, but then there's a draft of two pages uh, on the table. This was just to make a point that we are looking and seeing what is and watching what is happening in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, uh, and we are going to focus on that in, in the future too. Thanks. Does anyone, or Malta? One minute, please, because we must do the elections. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in today's world, multi-ethnic states are the norm. The traditional nation state where a distance national group uh, corresponds to a territorial unit has become an endangered species. Globalization and the increasing movement of people across border threaten to kill the nation state once and for all. However, some myths resist reality, and majority and dominant culture in countries around the world still seek to impose their identity on other groups with whom they share a territory. Attempts to improve uni uniculturalism and multi-ethnic environments often come at an expense of minority rights. To avoid marginalization, minorities often intensify their efforts to preserve right, and protect finish, their identity. Um, Madam Chair, I will conclude by saying that the main objective remains to prevent conflicts in multi-ethnic states before they happen. At both the, uh, at both the human and fund financial level of culture of prevention is more be beneficial than culture of reaction. All states, as well as all the international community, can work together to increase dialogue among parties and, and create an inclusive approach to national identity. It is important for states Finish. to make a commitment conclude, conclude. to to equal treatment of all persons, regardless of their racial and ethnic origin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we can finish the debate. Mr. Kokluglu. Uh, 
Sayın Başkan. Ee, öncelikle ülkemizde e, yaşandığı iddia edilen e, Kürt sorunu konusundaki e, eleştirilere cevap vermek istiyorum. Kürt kökenli vatandaşlarımız etnik aidiyetleri nedeniyle ülkemizde hiçbir ayrımcılığa ve kötü muameleye tabi tutulmamaktadırlar. Dolayısıyla böyle bir iddianın kabulü mümkün değildir. Ülkemizde Kürtler azınlık değil, Türkiye'nin e, ayrılmaz ve ciddi bir parçası ve unsurudur. E, Türkiye'de bir etnik çatışma yoktur. Ülkemizde yıllarca masum vatandaşların hatta Kürtlerin de kurban edildiği bir terör gerçeği vardır. Teröristlerle Kürt kökenli vatandaşlarımız arasında bir ayrım yapılması gerekmektedir. Ülkemizin bireysel hak ve özgürlüklerinin ilerletilmesi ve demokrasinin daha da kökleştirilmesi için bugüne kadar attığı adımlar bilinmektedir. Terörizmle mücadelede izlediğimiz çok boyutlu yaklaşım temelinde PKK saldırılarının sonlandırılması ülkemizde başlatılan bir süreç vardır. E, bu süreçle birlikte PKK'ya silah bıraktırılması ve terör şiddet eylemlerinin sonlandırılması amaçlanmaktadır. Böylelikle demokrasi sistem dahilinde meşru siyasi faaliyetlerin yürütebilmesi için elverişli bir ortam da yaratılmış olacaktır diye düşünüyoruz. Teşekkür ederim. We can move to the discussion about the amendments. We have two amendments tabled to the draft resolution, and I call Mr. Fitis of Cyprus to propose amendment one. Uh, thank one you, minute Madam only. Chair. The first amendment is irrationale. By the proposed additional paragraph, we wish to make a point on the established relation between economic hardship and high unemployment and the rise of nationalist, racist, and extremist political forces. In this context, it is important to stress the threat that uh, the growing influence of these forces poses on societies, particularly with regard to migrants, social cohesion, and state's overall stability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone wish to uh, Latvia? Oh, what is the first? <laughs> no problem. No problem for you. Thank you very much. Latvia, you have uh, the floor. Dear Madam Chair, uh, dear colleagues, in, in amendment number one, uh, in general, I agree with uh, this uh, uh, resolution, but uh, in amendment number one, the word nationalism is not used appropriately and not used correctly, uh, and that is not comparable with such terrible phenomena as racism and extremism in political life. In some European Union countries, nationalism is the means for survival of very small nations and uh, the means for opposing, for example, linguistic discrimination of the titular nation, as in the case of Latvia, where titular nation uh, is only 1.2 million of inhabitants. Therefore, I urge you to vote against amendment uh, number one. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Mr. Bostansi. Your opinion about uh, we agree with the uh, contribution, and we would like to uh, thank to the uh, colleagues who contribute the amendment. Okay, I shall put, I shall put now the amendment one to the vote. Votes in favour. Please raise your cards. Votes against? Abstentions? The amendment is adopted. Amendment 2, and I call again Mr. Fitis of Cyprus. We wish uh, that emphasis be placed on the central role education must have in states' efforts towards 
comprehensive and effective integration policies. It is important to stress in this context that non-access to vulnerable groups of which immigrants and their children to equal education, quality, and employment opportunities also means discrimination. As uh, witnessed uh, very recently, discrimination in education, which leads to low-paid jobs or idleness and poverty, constitutes one of the major causes of social unrest and violence. It is therefore essential, especially in the light of economic recession and cuts in public spending, including in the field of education, that the right to equal education and employment opportunities be unpaired and further promoted. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone uh, wish to speak against? No. Mr. Kukuloglu. Thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment is also a constructive contribution. It strengthens the text. We agree with it, and we're thankful. Thank you. Thank you. I put the amendment to the vote. Votes in favor, please raise your cards. Votes against? Abstentions? The amendment is adopted. And that concludes the discussion about the amendments. Thank you all. I propose that you, we now formally move to a vote on draft resolution. Those who vote in favor, please. Rise your cards. Abstention. Uh, votes against, please. Abstentions. The draft resolution is adopted. We now come to the election of committee officers for the 33 annual section of the Assembly. Nominations closed at 9 a.m. this morning. The International Secretariat informs me that the following nominations have been received in the table office. For chair, Mrs. Santos, from Portugal, Vice Chair Mr. Kulkuloglu, Turkey, Mi, uh, for re Rapporteur Ms. Gordana Jomic uh, se from Serbia, Mi, uh, Ms. Maria Lundqvist Brumster from Sweden, and Ms. Anne Phelan from Ireland. As the position of rapporteur is now contested, I declare that the nominee for that position in this case. Yes, as the position of chair is not contested, I declare that uh, the nominee for this position in this case is elected by acclamation and accordance with Rule 36. Likewise, as the position as Vice Chair is not contested, I declare that the nominee for that position, Mr. Kulkuloglu of Turkey, is elected by acclamation. I must thank you all for your trust in me and in Kokuloglu. And now, as the position of rapporteur is contested, we will have an election. I will hand over to the Secretariat to um, explain the bullet balloting process. <laughs> Uh, we, will now vote, we will now vote by secret ballot for the position of rapporteur. I remind you that the candidates are Ms. Gordana Komic of Serbia, Ms. Maria Lundqvist Blomster of Sweden, and Ms. Anne Filan of Ireland. Ballot papers have been prepared for the selection. To vote, 
please place a cross by the name of your preferred candidate. The candidate with an absolute majority of votes will be elected. If no candidate has an absolute majority of in the first ballot, a second round of voting will take place between the two candidates with the highest number of votes. I therefore ask you to remain in the committee room until the result has been announced. I have appointed Ms. Ar Ms. Arena from Belgium and Ms. Leonenko from Belarus as tellers to oversee the conduct of the election and the counting of the votes. Please come to the podium to collect your ballot paper. You must have your voting card with you. Staff will mark your card to indicate that you have been issued a ballot paper. Please keep your voting card in case a second round of voting is requested. The committee will be suspended while the votes are counted and will then resume for the results of, for the result to be announced. The result of the elections will also be announced in the plenary session. Thank you. Now we are moving to the elections. Thank you all for the conditions you give to us to work and to um, to conclude the agenda. Thank you all.